Hi there, and welcome back to the Personal Brand and Business Show. My name is Bob Gentle, and every week I speak to incredible people who share their secrets to building, marketing, and monetizing your expertise and the mindset you need for your business to grow and thrive. If you're new to the show, well, then while you still have your device in your hand, take a moment to subscribe, whether that's the audio version or the YouTube version. Just hit the subscribe button on Apple Podcasts. That's the follow button. Uh, that way you won't miss a single thing. If you are on YouTube, then hit the magic bell as well. And while you're busy with your fingers, hit the thumbs up. Um, and that way you can bask in the knowledge that you're just the best. So a podcast guest once said to me that if you want more sales, then you need more conversations. And this is really what we're going to be speaking about today. I am delighted to welcome Wendy Harris, author of Making Conversations Count, How to Sell Over the Phone, to the show. Wendy, welcome. Oh, thank you for having me, Bob. So I'm really excited today because I've, I'm finding more and more and more that a lot of people, my clients, and I see all over the world, will become very creative in the number of ways that they will find to avoid doing anything that could be described as selling. Um, and there's a whole industry sprung up designed to con us into thinking that there is a hack, there's a magical way to sell where you don't have to sell. And what I'm finding is that the only way to sell is to actually sell. And there are many ways that you can do this. And today, I think we're really going to talk about the art of the conversation and how to actually make that happen. But for the person who's meeting you for the first time, Wendy, can you maybe just start by telling us a little bit about who you are, where you are, and the kind of work you typically do? Well, I've relocated a year ago up to Scotland, so I'm not far from air. My, my neighbour. Um, yes, I realised that momentarily before I joined the the call today and I was like oh, we could have done this in person that would have been so exciting um um I have spent since 1988 picking up the phone and talking to people um about various different products and services it and I can appreciate why it scares people to do that um so a lot of my time is spent walking through why there is a fear of doing that and why there is an avoidance to do that and proving that actually when you start to approach it in the right manner, the needle moves and you can you can stay excited about continuing to do something. So in lots of ways, it's about then forming a habit and a good habit and not not putting yourself into the shoes of that image that always conjures up when you mention the word cold calling it just sends a so, shudder yeah and as you were introducing yourself i i would hope that pretty much anybody listening or watching is a little bit surprised that you don't necessarily come across as essentially assertive or, I mean, clearly not pushy, easy to listen to, um, and not the stereotypical. Aggressive oh, oh. or aggressor. They're quite, a, yeah. yes. Yeah. Um, it's, it's one of those things. I, I was lucky enough sort of, um, about 20, 2003, somewhere around then, um, to build my own team for a company. And and in that, I got to create the advert for it. And I, the headline was, Mums Wanted, part-time hours, school holidays off, must have a curious nature. Mm. And it was for a telecoms company phoning up, finding out whether people needed their telephones or phone lines upgrading, updated. And we grew to sort of six or seven mums in that team. 
and they all loved a good gossip. They were curious by nature to want to find out about the person at the end of the phone before we even started to tell them what we did. So I think if we first of all maybe put this in context for the listener, what does a typical telemarketer engagement look like? Because I think there is the stereotype of, I believe you were in a car accident. Um, <laughs> this is yeah. telemarketing. No. Oh, and my stock answer to that one is, oh, you mean the one I died in? Yeah. Um, <laughs> but the other end of the extreme is I've filled in a form because I want something. And then somebody's going to follow up, uh, but they're going to follow up effectively in person with a degree of genuine attention and interest. And then there's an awful lot in between. So from your perspective, in how do you visualize telemarketing integrating within, let's, let's maybe begin with the average small business. How can they make use of telemarketing either when they're, outsourcing it or they're bringing in or training somebody to do it well i think i think the first thing we need to do is is say that there's there's a b2c model and there's a b2b model b2c is like you've just described bob it's the i believe you've been in a car accident and there's not a lot of care or attention that goes into that model whatsoever um quite often the data is made up or years old because the sheer volumes of it that's created means that they can't keep pace for it to be relevant today to the person that they call in. So that's a challenge on its own and not necessarily my my area of expertise. Where, where I've spent my 35 plus year career is on the B2B and that is that You've got to set your intention of what is it that you want telemarketing to do. And it's different to telesales. So we all know what sales is and we all know what marketing is. The fact that we've got tele before it is simply that we're doing it, the activity over the phone. So when you're telemarketing, you've got to have a good reason to be speaking to the right person. Now, for a lot of the smaller businesses, they just go, oh, well, I just, I don't do any cold calling because it's just me. It feels weird putting myself forward. You know, I don't really want to sell something. Why would they pick me? And it, it's it's about picking that that reason so that you've got a sound approach and if you take the pressure away, if you're telemarketing, you're looking to qualify whether that person's interested in you or not. That's the sole purpose of that first stage of the call. So all you need to do is not sell anything anyway, is merely introduce yourself and find out about them. Because you'll be invited back based on that conversation, to have another and another and another until the timing is right for the transaction to happen. And I think that's that's where most people get it wrong, is that they think that that one call is, is, is going to discern the whole outcome. And it's just one small step. I really like that, because if you watch anyone in sales that's doing well, they're pretty consistently doing the same thing. They're establishing lines of communication. They're building rapport. They're engaging in conversations, small talk, and then gradually they will pivot to the sales conversation with permission. And then when the sales conversation happens, there's a simple yes, that makes sense, or no, not just now, or many of the other reasons why somebody would say no. But it begins with a line of communication and establishing whether there is a good fit in any 
in any way. Um, what's interesting is sales is very straightforward. And I was, I was thinking to myself earlier today, if you have a straightforward sales process, what are the numbers of reasons that it can fail? And actually the reasons were very few. And the probably the most obvious one was lack of discipline as failure to execute. All that was left was you're too expensive, the product's rotten, or you haven't explained yourself very well. Mm -hmm. um, but if you've got that qualification right and you're disciplined, you can't really go wrong, which is why in a lot of organizations, if they want to scale their sales, something like telemarketing is beautifully efficient. Um, yes. So in, it builds in for the future as well. And I, I tell this story often, and I worked for a creative design company about 14 or 15 years ago. Yeah, because um, my youngest is 15 now. So she, it would be about 14 years ago. And I was, I was their telemarketer looking to introduce their creative design services. And they still get calls for Wendy. Everybody yeah. in the business knows who Wendy is. And it's not because I was trying to say we're the best design agency and you should use us, which is the approach that a lot of businesses will take. I was wanting to understand, you know, how they're doing things already. What future plans have they got? And would those people be able to, to, to did they have the capacity to deliver those kinds of services? And simply just put ourselves forward as a really good plan B, should something happen. And there are reasons that, that that can come forward quicker is if that person leaves and goes somewhere else. We've created a, a great impression, a lasting impression that, that, you know, with look, they've kept the email, they've kept that in their inbox somewhere safe, they've filed it away, they've had a look at the website and gone, actually, yes, I liked that approach. They're the kind of people I would want to work with. Yeah. Should I ever need to? What I like about that is in in marketing and sales, everybody's, everybody's heard the, the importance of building the like, know, and trust. Mm -hmm. As you move down the marketing funnel or along the sales pipeline, we're trying to move people through the like, know, and trust in order that they will try and buy. And what you described to me there was simply calling up and making friends. Yeah, It's that straightforward because friends help friends. If I need to buy something, I'm going to go to somebody I know first. So what you've been doing for that organization is systematically becoming a known face, a trusted face, somebody they kind of like or don't like, which is also fine. Let them decide. Yeah. And then when the need arises, you become the line of least resistance, which is the most efficient route to market. So I really, really like that. I think to maybe put this in context for the listener, who's maybe thinking, but I want to build my business online. This still has a really important place because if you want to scale an online business, what you'll find is you have an awful lot of leads and those leads, something needs to happen with them. And are you as the business owner going to qualify, nurture mm -hmm. and convert every single one of those leads? No, you don't have the time. Or patience. For me, well, the patience, but also this for me is the important point. In the online space, we forget something really important. And it's probably the most powerful aspect of the sales process. And it's time. Buying decisions take time. And yet everything we do online is designed for that person who is ready for the impulse purchase today. And if they don't decide to buy today, they, a lot of the time, they're lost to us, unless you've maybe got some remarketing advertising and things built in. But if you could establish a relationship, yeah. 
and nurture that relationship at a personal level, even if it's not you as the business owner, but it's somebody there advocating for your business. When you're ready to become a customer, they'll fall in your direction rather than somebody else's. What you described there was creating a powerful bond and bonds are what ultimately lead to sales. It's overlooked too often, I think, Bob, that you can have somebody fill in an online form and the approach from said person within the company going back to that person can be pushy, aggressive, um, the demeanor or tone can be frustrated that, you know, you're not ready now. What do you mean? You know, this is my yeah. job to close you. And, and, and it really upsets me that that person is looking quite possibly for further down the line. You know, they're looking to position some help from some source for when they're ready and there's no telling how quickly that can go that can escalate simply because it depends who you who you find as to how quickly that project can build momentum mm. so if that's the impression that you're going to give somebody are you going to be the person that the company that's going to be considered in light of it being, you know, maybe two, three, six months down the line, that somebody's doing their due diligence now. So by understanding that that situation and knowing that they, you know, oh, you're just looking today. Okay, what other questions can I help you with? Is 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 it all about that relationship of telemarketing of qualifying them in? Hmm. That's where you want them. You want them in not out. So I think another really interesting aspect to this, because when people think about things like telemarketing or ads or direct mail, they automatically think, oh, but it's really expensive. I could just do some social media content. And social media content's time consuming, yeah, but it's free, or I could I could have a podcast. Um, where am I going with this? Self-service self well, is so easy, isn't it? Well, where I was coming from is in, in the advertising world, we know about the acceptable cost for acquisition of a customer. Yeah. So there's a proportionality here. If a, if a customer is worth, let's say, 5,000, mm -hmm. then you'd be willing to spend a certain amount to close that customer. And if your business has got the ability to scale hundreds of those or thousands of those, then it makes perfect sense to invest proportionately. And, and implement that into your bottom line, isn't it? Yeah. Mm. So if, if you can spend an extra £100, let's say, per customer that comes on board and that's worth 5,000 to you. And suddenly it, the, the, the logic of using a telemarketer is very favorable, favorable. It's better um, than the bank will give you. Yeah. Um, so I'm, I'm in danger of tying myself in some mental knots here. So I guess <laughs> like to you're already thinking now, of other projects, aren't you, Bob? That's what happens. Uh, I'm always hustling. Um, <laughs> so, what I'd like to look at now, I think, is if somebody, what I know for certain is there will be leaders of larger organizations listening, thinking, this all makes sense to me. I can see a way telemarketing I can have a role in my sales process. There will be small business owners thinking, okay, I can see I need to make some changes in what I'm doing myself. They don't have the means to necessarily hire somebody in. So what advice would you have to anybody for how they should maybe build some telemarketing systems into their own daily routines? The, the short answer and a long answer. The short answer is one call a day. Simple. 
you don't need to get yourself into too much of a of a, a lather picking up the phone to one person a day. The long answer is that one person that you do need to be speaking to every day over any fiscal month, that's 20 potential customers, need to be uh, almost, almost, you know, your gut instinct says that it's 90% sure that they would use you, your services because you don't know the story behind what they're doing already. At the end of at the end of a year, if you've got two hundred potential customers that you've re- reached out to, just one a day, and that's turned into what are the odds? Possibly about. I mean, I would say conservatively ten percent. What does that mean to your bottom line? It's really interesting. If if I, I look back at my business. Five years ago, I spent half the day on the phone. And a proportion of that was would be what I would call warm calling. I didn't do that much cold calling, but I did a lot of warm calling. I do none of that now. And I'm looking at this thinking, one call a day, that's 200 calls a year. How can I go wrong? What's really interesting is a question I ask a lot of business owners is, opportunity can come to us through one of four doors can come through content and content marketing, which is really depending on luck. The better you are at content marketing, the luckier you can get, but it's still luck. There's ads, which is great, but a lot of the time these are leads that aren't necessarily ready to become customers. Then there's relationships, which is difficult to scale. Um, But I think they are important because often relationships will bring the opportunities that are the insight that will change the game. Mm -hmm. But the one thing that you are in complete control of is your outbound sales activity. If you have a, a simple, logical, easy to follow sales process and you put energy into it, it cannot fail. Um, You are in complete control of your destiny there. And I think that's so important for people to understand that, There are a lot of people out there on the internet that make a lot of money making sales look like some kind of magical process, but it comes down to discipline. Um, Mm. We are our own unicorns, really, aren't we? What do you mean by that? Oh, I know what you mean by that. That's really clever. Yeah. Um, I talk about, you know, telemarketing and telesales, and there's, there's this bridge and that's that's really what happens is you go over this rainbow bridge. You are the unicorn that that takes it from here's somebody that I've identified as could potentially be my customer. They're not ready to be my customer yet, but I'm going to look after them and I'm going to sprinkle lovely stuff all over them and I'm going to take them over this rainbow bridge and then they're going to be my customer and we're going to live happily ever after. You know, uh, if if you can put some fun into what it is that you're doing, it makes the conversation so much easier as well. And I think that's 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 another stumbling block is, well, what do I say when I, you know, I know I need to make these calls, but what do I say to them? And I think you put it really succinctly, Bob. We're making friends all the way. In the corporate, corporate contracts that I've handled over the years, you know, I'm talking to FTSE 100, PLC companies, multi-billion pounds worth it really doesn't make any difference whether it's a solopreneur or one of those organizations. There are lots of people moving the machine, a terminology that that listeners will recognize that I despise is the gatekeeper, right? I mean, we're players in this game and yet we've got to get past the gatekeeper, And you know what? They're not all trolls underneath the bridge waiting to come out and wave their axe at you. They can be the most influential people you will ever speak to. So why would you be rude? You would you would build that relationship first, because when you when you hear that the boss took the call because 
Aunt Mabel, who answers the phone that you've just, you know, all of her grandkids names, you know, where she's been on holiday, right, has said, you really need to speak to Wendy because she's lovely. You know, she's not been pushy. She's been persistent, but she really is keen. I think she would genuinely be able to help us with why she's wanting to be in touch with you. I've took the call because Mabel said I should. Yeah, you built an internal advocate. It's it's so important. So, so important. So there'll be people thinking at home, I like the idea of cold calling, but I'm scared. I call it cold calling. I'm not going to call it cold calling again. I like the idea of telemarketing, making calls yeah. to people that don't know me yet. The phone rings, it's answered. Hello. When people answer that, when, when I get those calls, there's one thing guaranteed to get my back up. Is that Bob? Fair enough. How are you doing today? Now I'm annoyed. <laughs> yeah, because like, we don't know each other. Yeah, and but the, I know telemarketers are often taught if you can get yeah. somebody to say yes, then they will continue the conversation. Yes. Or So I don't want to necessarily talk about the, the bad examples, but if somebody's listening at home thinking, okay, I like the idea, but how do I break the ice? What advice would you offer anybody for the moment the phone is answered? How should you greet that person and have them welcome moving forwards with you in that conversation? Sort of six words. Hello, please, can you help me? <laughs> right? It breaks down all barriers because we're all naturally, you know, we're, we're conditioned, aren't we, to be helpful. And if it's asked with the right tone of voice, yeah, if I can, right, great. And then, then you look to qualify. Well, I've got the, the uh, I've got that Bob is the best person to speak to. Are you Bob? Oh, great. I didn't want to make any assumptions. You know. It's 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 about the same on the phone as you would if you were to walk into a market into a networking room and to be introduced to somebody. Oh, Bob! Oh, I've been told that you're the best person to speak to. How, how does that work for you? Yeah. What do you what do you do? You know, you're you're, you're asking about them or straight away. You might it's as good as asking them what the weather's like and if they had a good holiday. Yeah. Putting it on that same footing. So as you were talking, I was imagining a couple of scenarios. And for me, this is getting into the really interesting part of the conversation, which is two people have made that call. Mm -hmm. One of them is a guy or, or a girl working at a company who if you were to go looking for them online, they barely exist. They're clearly just what you would call functionaries. They're people yeah. in a job tasked to do telemarketing. And then there's another person who's calling and they have established some leadership credentials. They perhaps have a podcast or a YouTube channel. They perhaps have written a book and they probably have the same call but after the call, the person receiving it is going to say, who's this Wendy Harris person? They're going to look online. They're going to go, oh, that person looks like they're kind of a big deal. And for me, this is really looking at the power of the personal brand as an amplifier or a, po a point of leverage or a force multiplier when it comes to telemarketing. That the next time you call back, it's, oh, my God, it's, it's the Wendy Harris calling me now. <laughs> And a lot of the time we underestimate the potency of even the limited work that can be done on a personal brand to facilitate somebody being actually quite excited to hear from you. Um, I know when, when this is done, I was not going to say to me, but when I'm on the receiving end of somebody that's made an effort in the world to be some kind of industry leader, I am thrilled to be speaking to them. Whereas when I'm simply getting a call from the telemarketer, 
Yeah. It's not the same. And I think this is what people need to understand when they're listening at home as a solopreneur in a business. You have a huge advantage. So you probably need to do less work to be more effective um, in this telemarketing. It's it's something that comes up a lot in the training and development that I do with teams. That's the there could be six, six people, you know, it's a mixture of guys and girls. And there's there's always a, a, a an array of personality types, yet the advice is the same for everybody. He could be one of those that stands up and waves his arms around and, you know, is, is the cheeky chappy, right? Then you've got the quiet, reserved, um, you know, I'm doing this for my daughter so I can go and pick her up from nursery and I wish I'd, I wished I was more like him. No, absolutely not. Because there, like you say, you know, if it's just the facilitator or somebody who's got some presence about them, which is really what we're saying, who would you want to speak to? The person with presence, because you think that you're getting more value from that. So when when I had the mousy mum say I should be more like him, no. You need no. to be more like you because that's that's ultimately all we have is our individuality. That's our USP to yeah. be you in your and be comfortable being you is what will amplify you. When you look to create a personal brand that jars with who you really are and doesn't truly align with your values and beliefs people see through that you know on the phone you only have one sense at your at your disposal your hearing so that tool is going to decide whether i like or trust this person do i believe them are they authentic yeah. is it real so the closer you can be to being yourself, the less you have to worry about all of that. I think that's true within the context of telemarketing. And I think that's also true within the context of your wider personal brand that stands out a mile when people are trying to create a brand that it's odds, that's at odds with their actual personality. Um, there, there's always an obvious friction which really it's, it's very difficult to sustain i think my my perspective earlier on was more in terms of when i'm when i'm calling somebody now as bob gentle with a podcast with a little bit of content on youtube with a lot of great thought leadership content on LinkedIn, when people check me out, they go, oh. Whereas mm -hmm. if I hadn't done any of that, I would just be another telemarketer. Same voice, but without the external things influencing people as well. Um, and it comes down to the, the whole decision-making process, isn't it? Is that we don't, we, we buy on emotion, and then fact check it with logic. Yeah. And then we compare that with how we felt in the first place. So it's 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 the same. And, th and that's where I think things have changed from when I first started out in the late 80s. You could sell that first call. People would go, gosh, that was that that's just what I want. Yes, send me some of that or come and see me. You know, there was less barriers. Now it's way more complicated. All these 17 touches, you know, when they say 17 touches in the sales cycle, that doesn't mean 17 phone calls. That means that, you know, you've got to be on LinkedIn, you've got to be on Instagram, they're going to check out your website. What does your lead magnet say? Are they on your newsletter? I mean, you know, Bobby, the list can be endless and equally paralyzing to the sales cycle. Yeah. But one tool in the toolbox of many things is deciding which tools you need for your business. So 
if somebody is thinking, okay, I want to give this a go myself, what should be in the toolbox? Um, what are the practical prerequisites, the things you have to do before you pick up the phone? It's generally a good idea to do that snooping on social media and on their website to see if there is any inkling into, you know, them telling stories that aligns with what you want to talk about because that just facilitates a much easier conversation. You can even, you know, if whether that person's actively posting, whether that company's actively updating their blog, you know, what sort of approach have they got to selling themselves tells you a lot about the approach that you need to mirror in terms mm. of how they will buy. And we forget that a lot. Um, so if some if if there's an, if it's an individual that you're looking to reach, do they post a lot? What's their tone of voice? How, what sort of personality? You because you can start to build a bit of a picture uh, around people before you make that call, and it, it can even give you a reason to say, oh, "Gosh, I saw your post about you know AI ranting." You know that's that's a topical one. Um, <laughs> Uh, and I totally agree. You can't replace human emotion, you know. So it's it's about you know giving yourself a really good reason, yeah, to make that call. That's nothing to do with the what you want from it. Another question, I guess, is I've worked with a lot of sales teams, and all sales teams are not created equal. There are some sales teams that call themselves sales teams, but they're order takers. Mm -hmm. And then there are other sales teams that, and these are rare, they're very proactive with outbound calling. They're, they're happy cold calling, but they're few and far between. The one thing that is consistent is this experience of call reluctance. People will always find a reason to not do the cold calling uh, or the prospecting. So as somebody who spent a lot of time helping people become comfortable with that. What are a few little strategies that people can use to get ready for the, the anxiety that will rise for the moment they dial the number, um, the, the, the jitters, if you like? I would always say that if you've got a really good feeling, if you've got a list, say you've got 20 people that you want to, to reach out to that month, there should be should pretty good reason for you to be wanting to introduce yourself. Move to the end of how many of those are going to be your customer and how good that feels. But more importantly is that once you open and start that conversation, so long as your motivation is that you are going to be helping them with something in their business or life, then actually you win anyway. Yeah. Yeah. But what you've done is you've made them the winners first. And that's such a really good feeling. So imagine really like that feeling. Yeah. So I think I, I am very motivated. I, I've had so many ideas today. I, I think sales is the lifeblood of any business. If you're not selling, your business is really, really going to struggle. So the more insight and opportunity we can bring into the selling space the better and if you're listening at home watching thinking i need more customers you've just been given a way that you can take charge of that that doesn't depend depend on fancy strategies it doesn't depend on funnels it's just simply make a list of ideal customers and start making friends and friends help friends at the end of the day wendy if people want to go deeper with you, if they want to find out more about you, how can they do that? I know you have a podcast. I do. Um, it's Making Conversations Count. Um, find me on LinkedIn. I hang out there all the time. Make sure when you send me an invitation to connect that you mention Bob's show. That's where, where we know one another from, where you've heard about me. Um, I'm always up for a chinwag. Um it's, you know, it's because like you say, for me, conversations are the lifeblood 
of business. So, you know, you never know where that conversation will lead. And you can get Wendy's book on Amazon. It's Making Conversations Count, How to Sell Over the Phone. Um, I will order a copy. I'm super motivated for that one call a day. Um, That's great. Your website, WAG Associates, W A G. Uh, well, that's that's the historic. That's that's the the old brand. Um, but makingconversationscount.com also exists. So it depends which one you like the most. I will go and have a look. I haven't seen that one yet. How could I miss uh, it? <laughs> Wendy, what's one thing you do now that you wish you started five years ago? Oh, do you know? The one thing that I do now that I wish I'd have started five years ago was the podcast that is now mm. three years old, um, which is in, which has flown by. And the reason for that is that where when you have a podcast that is looking to serve and uh, like yourself, Bob, it's about paying forward to the next generation coming through. It opens doors to people that you would never, ever believe possible to speak to. Um, it gives it, it's also like a bit of a learning and development without mm. you realizing because of the insights that you get to share. Um, and it's just a privilege to be in other people's ears when it you're not in the room is. with them. Mm. Yeah. Wendy. You have been an awesome guest. I've learned a lot. Um, I'm very motivated. I really am astonished at how much I have changed over the last five years. I used to live on the telephone. I I got a new phone the other day, and it took me two days to realize there was no mobile signal on it, and I wasn't getting any calls. Oh, no. Thoroughly. But only one person tried to call me. The world has changed so much. And I think for the listener, this is your golden opportunity. A phone call has become a very special thing. Yes. Um, you want to stand out? Hit the phone. Um, Wendy, thank you for your time. We're definitely going to be talking again. Um, but that does bring us to the end of another episode. Thank you at home for listening, our watching. And if you did enjoy the show, I would invite you to leave a five-star review. That's five, wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you did enjoy the show, you will love the Personal Brand Business Roadmap. It's 50 pages of everything you need to start, scale, or fix your expert business 100% free as a gift from me. Just tap the link in the show notes or visit amplifyme.agency forward slash roadmap. I got through that without dropping the ball, Wendy. You did very well. I'm impressed, Bob. Thank you so much for today. I've really enjoyed it. Thank you.